Welcome. And tonight we're in Psalm 107. It's the beginning of book five of the Psalms. The Psalms are divided into five books, as you now know. And this is a very long Psalm, so we're only going to take part one of it, which is verses 1 through 23. This Psalm was relied upon by the pilgrims. Do you know? Do you remember the pilgrims? It, this psalm, describes the many dangers, toils, and snares that the Christian goes through, that they experience. And also, what the pilgrims experienced prior to, during, and after their journey to the new world. Now, you need to know a little bit about history, real history, not fake history, to know the setup of the pilgrims. But bear in mind, 102 people crossed the Atlantic to come to the new world. And most of what we know from um, or about the pilgrims is actually quoted in the writings of Governor William Bradford, who was an eyewitness. He was the governor, and uh, he wrote the account of the founding of the Plymouth Plantation right here in Massachusetts. They landed on Monday... December 11th, 1620. And they had church the day before on board. And it is thought that this psalm was the text on that Sunday, the day before they set their foot in the new world. Isn't that something? They know that because of the writings, the diary of Bradford mentioned the service and he alludes to and quotes Psalm 107. Really, really cool. So this is a praise song of the regathered people. Remember, God allowed his people to be taken into exile in Babylon. And then they were released and they came back. And uh, after what's called the Babylonian captivity, the people gave great thanks to God um, for being released. And thanksgiving is very important, right? There's some attitudes that should be universal for all Christians. If you're a Christian, you should be marked by thanksgiving, gratefulness to God and others for what they've done. You should also be marked by contentment, to be content with the providences that, that the Lord has given you. Not so content that you're complacent or prayerless, but if God says it a certain way, that you're content and you can live there knowing that, you know, God is in control. He can be trusted. And so um, we all know that the unregenerate heart does not glorify God nor give thanks to him. Romans one twenty one says that. You know it's like the, it reminds me of the little picture. Um, of the little boy sitting down to, to eat with his friend. His friend's not a Christian and he is. And he's about to pray before he eats. But his friend just starts eating. And the other friend says, what are you doing? He says, I always give thanks to God before I eat. And he says, what about you? Are you like the pigs? You just go right to it. 
<laughs> you know? Did you ever eat without giving thanks? Just feels kind of gross, doesn't it? It's like not going to church on Sunday. I feel like I need a shower or something. A spiritual shower. I couldn't imagine. Even if I wasn't a pastor, I don't know if I could not go to church on Sunday. I don't think I could do it. I looked at some of those videos from the from the pandemic when we were all like not coming here. It was terrible. I looked like a prisoner. My hair was so long and beard was so long and disheveled. How'd you people even put up with me? I looked ridiculous. No one called me up and said, oh, by the way, you look ridiculous. <laughs> but let's go to the word. Uh, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Now that's a, you give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. It's a call to worship. It's a summons to praise. For his steadfast love endures forever. Here's my favorite line right here. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Brothers and sisters, if you've been bought back by the Lord Jesus Christ, say so. Say so everywhere. Just say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Now you think about this, and um, we are summons to praise, right? That's what we're to do. That's why we go to church, principally, to give praise to God together. It's our job. That's right. right? We don't go because we like the food. We don't go because the preacher might be a nice guy. We, we don't go to see what uh, Susie's wearing. You know? We go to praise God. It's our job. And because he's God, we want to give him honor the first morning of the first day of the week. How many know that the week does not begin on Monday? It begins on Sunday. And I have a schedule. I've had a schedule for 34 years, this pocket schedule. I don't use a computer in the court. And the list this year, they started putting the first day of the week as Monday. And it's flipped me out. I can't even do it. I still can't get it. I'm like off a day. What do I do? You know, I don't know what to do. I call somebody, yell, hey, you know. And I'm like, sir. So one of the motives of praise is starting in verses 4 through 9. And that is homes for the homeless. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Listen. For he satisfies the longing soul. And the hungry soul he fills with good things. So the pilgrims, for instance, were hunted and haunted in merry old England. Here's why. Because there was a king, right? And his name was Henry the Eighth. I guess he was the guy that um, was sung about by um, Herman's Hermits. Remember, I'm um, Henry the Eighth. I am. Well, Henry the Eighth um, was ruling, and um, he had a wife. Well, he had a lot of wives. But one of his wives he didn't like that much, Catherine of Aragorn, because he wanted a male heir. And Catherine got pregnant, and she gave birth to a girl. So Henry said um, to the Pope, he called the Pope up uh, back then, which was probably sending a ship to the Vatican. <laughs> got there like uh, three months later. And the word said, uh, Pope, I want to 
you to bless my divorce from Catherine. I like this other girl, Anne Boleyn, because I think marrying her will get me the male heir I'm looking for. The Pope sent his ship with his message back, and he said, no way, Jose. <laughs> you have no grounds for marriage. We ain't going there. Henry then sent his ship back, and he said, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. He took the whole Church of England out of Roman Catholicism and started the Church of England, who was the head of the Church of England, why he was. The king or queen of England is the head of the Church of England, now known as the Anglican Church. In America, known as the Episcopal Church, but now it's going back to Anglican because the Episcopal Church has largely apostatized. So Henry then appointed someone that knew something about spirituality and called him the Archbishop of Canterbury. So the Archbishop of Canterbury is kind of like the Pope of the Anglican Church. Now, what happens is Henry, like many people, dies. His son becomes king. His name, Edward. Edward dies. You know how old he was when he died? Fifteen. He became king when he was very young. Then uh, his other child became queen. Her name, Mary. You may remember her as Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary says, that's it. We're out of here. We're going back to Catholicism, and the Church of England is done. They call her Bloody Mary not because she likes tomato drinks with vodka and celery in them in the morning. They call her Bloody Mary because she kills people like crazy. Not directly, indirectly. Hey, you, get rid of her. But remember uh, Henry, back to Henry for a minute. Catherine... Right? She had a girl. Well, doesn't Anne Boleyn, who he marries after he divorces Catherine when he's the head of the church, doesn't Anne give him a girl too? <laughs> well, then what happens is the um, Bible's being translated into English in Switzerland called the New Geneva Bible, or the Geneva Bible. Henry then authorizes, oh, well, the King of England authorizes the authorized version or the King James Version. And, and then the king says, the King of England says, no Geneva Bible for you. You got to read the King James Version. And also, there's only one church. It's called the Act of Uniformity. You can't go to any other churches. The Church of England is the only church in England. And the pilgrims said, no thanks. Because there was a reformation in Europe, right, with Calvin and Luther and others and Knox. But that was a reformation of belief. The reformation in England was just Henry coming out, saying, I don't want you guys because I want to divorce my wife. And so the pilgrims and the Puritans said, this Reformation needs to go a lot deeper. And it needs to be spiritual and theological. We're out of here. And they said, no, you're not out of here. Get back here. And they said, nope, we're not going to go. They put him in jail. They hunted them, haunted them, killed people. Where did they go? They went, like Wilma, to Holland. They go across the channel, they get into Holland, and then from Holland they come to the new country. And as they go through all this, they go through all these things. And how do they keep themselves together? 
by looking at Psalm 107 in one way, in one example, and noting that Psalm 107 describing what they're going through. They were homeless. They left Holland with no place to go. An undeveloped America with some Wampanoag Indians going around and they weren't quite sure. And the spiritual application is that without God, we all are homeless. We are like the prodigal son in the far country, right? And um, until we come to our senses, we don't have a home. Secondly, God gives us freedom from the captives. And these people were imprisoned. Uh, people like us who are not persecuted largely, or actually not at all, we're imprisoned. If you want to see people in prison, walk around Gardner. People walking around everywhere, they're in prison to sin. They're slaves to sin, right? Um, sin is miserable. Sin is habitual. The deeper you get, the harder it is to get out. It's a trap. Satan is setting it. He's baiting it. And there's a point where you can't do anything but sin. I think today we call that a lot of times mental illness, but it's really nothing more than sin gone to seed. And so, remember uh, Jacob Marley on Dickens' you know, Christmas Carol? He has, comes in with all his chains and, and Scrooge says, what are those chains? He says, these are the chains that I forged in life, link by link. It's a great picture of habitual sin just as you making your own chain. And so um, we don't have much time, but let me say this. What a lot of Christians don't understand is we all we all know there's going to be a final judgment, right? And that's coming. But we don't remember or we don't know or we forget that God meets out temporal judgments. Um, judgments that echo the judgment to come. And they're coming in this world. There's no doubt, folks, that America is under many temporal judgments right now. If you have to kind of pinch yourself to see the insanity that's going around and saying that people are accepting this and uh, calling it good, calling it what, the, what it should be, uh, normal, and that we should all be doing this, and you can't say certain things. Yesterday, I ordered a court transcript, um, and, and then it had a drop-down box about what my pronouns were. I'm ordering a transcript from a court for an appeal. It wants to know my... It's the first time I ever answered this question in my life. What are your pronouns? And there was a drop-down box. You couldn't get through the whole thing unless you picked one. So why do they, why do they want to know that? They're going to call me up and say, "Yeah, how is he doing today?" You know, I, I don't know. Does it matter? All you're going to do is mail me a transcript when it's done. Why do you need to know my pronouns? Is that a way of finding out where I stand? If I give you the traditional ones, am I outing myself as a heterosexual? I hope so. Come on down. Season's open. No, sorry. Uh, let's cut that out of the tape. No. But anyway, um, it's just insanity out there. And we look at, you know, some of our leaders. I'm flabbergasted, aren't you? Did you ever think that you'd see people so grossly incompetent? There are 350 million people in the United States. 
Are you telling me that the ones that are at the top are the best, the cream of the crop of 350 million people? I don't believe it. We've got people that can do lots of things, but guess what? That's what we got. You know why? Temporal judgments of God. I wish we had more time. We don't. I don't want to keep you beyond the appointed hour. I already have. But anyway. Well, four of the 102 pilgrims died before landing. One the day before. One of those four. And then guess what? That first cruel winter, they called it the starving time. Half of them. Half died and God blessed them you know what he blessed them with the Wampanoag Indians who taught them how to get food even in the winter and how to store food and that Thanksgiving that's a real thing except it lasted three days that's my kind of feast (laughs) that's like the golden corral on steroids bro (laughs) what I wanted to get to was verse 23 some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters and that is verse 23 through 29 it's talking about safety for those at sea or those in peril on the sea that section of the psalm gave birth to a hymn in 1860 called Eternal Father, Strong to Save. And it's become the most popular hymn of the British Navy in the United States Navy. Talks about people in peril on the sea. It's been played at the funerals of Prince Philip, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, George Herbert Walker Bush, John F. Kennedy, based on this psalm. And the legend goes that it was played on the Sunday before the Titanic went down. But there's some dispute as to whether that is true. It certainly was played in worship on that trip. Question is, was it the Sunday before the thing? Um, it was uh, meant a lot. The ocean meant a lot to uh, John Newton's conversion. It meant a lot to Wesley's conversion. You ever been on a, a ship that's sinking or going to sink in the sea? I haven't, but it's said that it's a really terrifying thing because you know you're about to be suffocated. That's a tough way to go. And in the Titanic, the water was 28 degrees. You didn't even have a chance to be suffocated. Your lungs would stop working because the water, you drop it into 28 degree water. That's, that's colder than ice water. That's right. You know. So anyway, but the point is, the Lord is our safe haven for those in peril. We're all in peril on the sea, meaning we're in the sea of this world. It's turbulence. It's trauma. It's changeableness, and we're anchored in Jesus. He is our safe harbor. He is our safe haven. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace to us. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which speaks to all of life's vicissitudes. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement there is that even though you inflict temporal judgments, you do give mercy. And this mercy is grace. It's undeserved. It's blessed. We thank you, Lord, that your steadfast love endures forever. And help us as the redeemed to say so. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.